Hi guys and welcome or welcome back. My name's Nelly, and today I have for you a March books video. So this is what I read in the month of March. It's a pretty small stack, but I'm excited to talk about the books, so I'm just gonna get straight into it. So the first book that I'm gonna be talking about is My Year of Rest and Relaxation by Tessa Moshfeg. Um, she's a super popular writer right now and is sort of known for writing de grotesque descriptions of the body and about taboo subjects. And I expected nothing less of My Year of Rest and Relaxation. Um, I think I read her second novel, Eileen, just a few months ago, and I really enjoyed it. And I read um, her short story collection, Homesick for Another World, which was also really good. So the book is about an unnamed narrator living in New York City between the year 2000 and 2001. And essentially after experiencing a lot of um, grief after the death of her parents and also going through a hard long-term breakup, she decides that she wants to experience complete oblivion for a year. And this plan is going to be aided by the help of a very kooky psychiatrist who she convinces um, to prescribe her a lot of sleeping medications so that she can essentially stay awake for only a few hours every day and watch Whoopi Goldberg movies and basically just not exist for a year. But the plan's interrupted by her best friend Reva who sort of breaks into her house to um, ask for advice and complain and vent about some of the difficult things that she is going through in her life. So Moshbag kind of balances um, like irony, pop culture references, humor, and really bizarre and over the top characters and situations with um, delving into really deep subjects like grief and mental illness because we're obviously dealing with a protagonist who has really severe depression. So I really loved this book. I think its greatest achievement is that um, despite having such a bizarre plot and really over-the-top kooky characters, um, Moshfag is able to make all of it feel so real and I think she really does this through a great mastery of tone and voice because um, since the narrator is extremely depressed and grieving, all of our descriptions of things um, do sound pretty mundane. This is in first person, so um, the narrator is the one who is describing everything that happens. So this book is set in a kind of interesting moment in time. Um, like I said, it's 2000 to 2001, so it's sort of um, post Y2K, pre 9-11, dot com boom era. And I think it's kind of cathartic as a millennial reader in 2021 because we can see how the culture of that time is impacting the um, psyche of the narrator. I think Moshfeg really captures how um, when you have depression, you can be surrounded by all of these people. The narrator is living in Manhattan and can throw open her window and see all of this life being experienced around her, but she cannot participate in it no matter how hard she tries. Um, and I think it's really beautiful that Moshfeg felt that this main character was worthy of her story being told. Um, and I think that's what makes this my favorite book of Moshfegs, while still having her sort of like signature irony and sense of humor, uh, it still feels so real. And I think she does such a great job of showing us the um, internal world of this character. I think this book would be best suited for readers who do like a little bit more of a character focused um, story because this is not really a plot heavy book. There is obviously um, not a whole lot happening and it's mostly a pretty internal book. So um, I will say that I just want to give a trigger warning for anyone who is thinking of reading this book just for um, mental illness, eating disorders, and mentions of suicide and death. But yeah, I think I would give this book a solid 10 out of 10, maybe 9.5 out of 10. So the next book that I'm going to be talking about is I Hold a Wolf by the Ears by Laura Vandenberg. Um, this was a super 
anticipated read for me. I am maybe one of Laura Vandenberg's biggest fans. I have two of her short story collections, um, The Isle of Youth and What the World Will Look Like When All the Water Leaves Us. Um, and I also have a couple of collections of her husband's, who's also a short story writer, Paul Yoon. Um, and I love her writing so dearly. So her other collections do have a lot to live up to. They are some of my favorite short story collections in the way that they experiment with genre as well as um, center all female protagonists. I think um, that's something that she has said in interviews as being a really important feature of her writing, which is that she always writes um, women main characters. So this collection does have some of her signature features like genre bending, which means that she takes um, familiar tropes from genres like mystery and noir to um, make them more literary, I guess, and more character-based instead of being um, plot-based. So a lot of these stories are like mystery, noir, um, deal with like sort of uh, bigger drama, like murder, suicide, um, but instead of focusing on those events themselves, they take a more like character-focused um, approach and focus on how these sort of like big things like misogyny, violence, um, capitalism influence the psychology of the characters. So I think this collection is going to be maybe a little bit more polarizing for readers than her other collections just because it deals with a lot of heavy stuff um, and sometimes goes into a more dark or disturbing place than some of her other stories do. And also I found that almost all the main characters in these stories are sort of morally ambiguous or unlikable, which I think is one of the threads that ties all of the stories together. Another thing that I really like about this collection is that each of the stories take place against the backdrop of somewhere else, so they're sort of travel stories in a way. Um, there's one that takes place in Iceland, Italy, um, Mexico, and they often deal with uh, a protagonist who does something that they shouldn't have. Like I said, a lot of the protagonists are pretty unlikable, or at least um, the story is sort of trying to understand how they feel about big mistakes that they have made. And I think that's sort of interesting when paired with these completely different landscapes because we're able to really see how the characters react to having to be themselves in a place that's completely unfamiliar to them. So even though each story does feel surprising and a bit surreal, which I think is one of the things that I like best about Laura Vandenberg, I felt that a lot of the stories in this collection, I didn't feel the um, emotion that's supposed to be behind the plot. And um, sometimes the endings fell a little bit flat for me. So I think I would recommend this collection to people who are satisfied by short stories, obviously, and then also by um, sort of like brevity because the stories in this collection really get in and then they jump right out. They don't um, like sort of linger on the emotional depth of what the characters are experiencing for too long. But they're really strange and really interesting, so uh, I might first recommend her other two collections, but I would definitely recommend this collection. The next book that I'm going to talk about is uh, Self Care by Lee Stein. I don't want to talk about this book. <laughs> it's so bad. So I picked this book up because I've seen it all over t uh, TikTok and I have read a poetry collection from Lee Stein before. Um, it's called Dispatch from Another World and I would highly recommend it. Um, it's super interesting and sort of uh, full of really amazing pop culture references and I think it's really funny and surprising but I really hated this book. <laughs> I don't think I have read a book that I hated this much as like an adult. The book switches between three first person narrators who are um, all women who work for this company called Ritual and it's sort of a self-care app um, like 
by Gwyneth Paltrow meets Instagram. It's like part social media platform. Um, and the three main characters are Marin Gelb, who is the co-founder of the company, um, Devin Avery, who is the CEO, and uh, Khadijah Walker, who is their very first employee. Marin and Devin, who are both the co-founders, are these sort of out-of-touch white women who um, it often feels like prioritize their company over uh, the women that they're actually supposed to be serving, though it seems like they're just pretending to do so. And Khadijah Walker is um, their first employee and she's a woman of color and we sort of see how she has to walk on eggshells around particularly Marin um, and how she's really mistreated by the company. So the story kind of begins with Marin Gelb um, making a tweet, I think while she's semi-intoxicated, about um, Ivanka Trump, which is interpreted as being a death threat and leads to sort of the main events of the um, plot unfolding, including the main one being uh, Marin going on a sort of um, self-care retreat that the other founder forces her to um, go on, where she's basically just in a cabin in the woods by herself um, without any social media. So the book kind of follows each of these women as these um, scandals and small dramas unfold, and it's sort of all against this millennial pink um, backdrop of girl boss culture and white feminism. So I think where I can start with my criticism of this book is that Stein calls it a satire, um, and specifically a satire of girl boss culture and influencers, but I didn't feel like it accomplished being a satire at all. So the thing that's sort of weird about it is that a satire is supposed to be um, super over the top so that it calls attention to what it is criticizing, but in this book the things that she is talking about are pretty much all real life events and people, so this is taking place in like a post-Trump inauguration world where, you know, influencers do Glossier ads and the main characters are using like Shiseido products, eye creams and stuff, like things that influencers actually use in real life. And the only thing that is unreal about the book, I guess, is the company that the main characters created. But even that just feels like Instagram. None of the devices that Stein is using actually feel that over the top, and even the way that the characters act feel pretty much exactly the way that we see influencers and these sort of like millennial startups act in real life. So I felt that this made it fall into a kind of uncanny valley um, between real and satire in that um, like basically everything in the book is analogous to real life, but it just felt like an extended judgment of real life events and people in real life like influencers um, who I didn't feel like Stein understood very well or wanted to complicate or describe in any sort of nuanced way. It really feels that this is just her argument for why influencers um, suck. It's fine, of course, to criticize influencers and girl boss culture. There's so much to um, dislike there, but I think the point that I'm trying to make is that it didn't feel like she was saying anything new or interesting. We already know that influencers go and get extremely expensive um, facials and plastic surgery. We already know that they, you know, take expensive yoga classes and drink smoothies and energy shots and have like mugs with annoying phrases on them. Um, and we know that social media can be incredibly toxic and produce um, a lot of burnout and insecurity, but there was nothing new about the way that she presented those opinions. It just felt like all of the dominant criticisms of internet culture packaged into a plot that is almost completely one-dimensional. So one of the things that I was thinking about this book 
is that rather than being a feminist book, it's sort of a book about feminists. A feminist book like Girl, Woman, Other would try to shed light on women's issues and complicate the experiences of women in the world, but instead this book just sort of indulges stereotypes, makes them super one-dimensional and uncomplicated, um, and in general it's just a cynical perspective on um, some of the things that women are dealing with right now. So I would not recommend this book, it's like a 4 out of 10 for me. So the last book that I'm going to be talking about is The Half Known World by Robert Boswell. It has a very nice cover, I think. Um, but this is a collection of essays that are sort of um, instructional writing guides about some of the craft-related technical issues um, that fiction writers might face. So I'm someone who writes short stories and obviously wants to get better at it, so I thought this would be a great place to start. Um, and he essentially uses excerpts from lectures that he's given, as well as examples like Dennis Johnson, Tolstoy, Flannery O'Connor, to illustrate the things that he's talking about. So my favorite essay in this collection is The Half Known World. It's the title piece and the first essay in the collection, um, so you can't miss it if you pick up the book. I think this is such a great description of what makes good fiction good, and it essentially argues for the process of using half-knowledge, um, which is like curiosity and openness about what characters can do or say to propel a narrative rather than the writer believing that they know everything about the characters before they even get started. Boswell kind of juxtaposes that process with writing with full knowledge, and he uses like television and movies as an example of that because they sort of appeal to stereotypes and tropes, which he thinks um, is like full knowledge. The writers of the TV shows already feel like they know everything about the characters and the characters are always going to behave exactly how they're supposed to. An example that I can think of is in Friends, you know how each of the characters are going to behave because you already know everything about them. You always know how Joey's gonna react to a situation versus how Rachel's going to react to a situation, and Boswell would argue that that makes them um, flat or one-dimensional. They can never act in the sort of like more realistic ways that human beings would respond to things, which is um, unpredictable. Like people are never going to be exactly what you think that they're going to be. So I think this essay is obviously more for writers than it is for readers because he's sort of arguing against the popular writing exercises which have you write down a list of all the characters' attributes, like what they ate for breakfast this morning, the top 10 books on their bookshelves, etc. And I think I relate to this concept a lot because I've always hated exercises like that. I find the thing that is most enjoyable about writing to be slowly uncovering what is going to happen and kind of watching these characters develop in front of me. And I think without that surprise element, I wouldn't think writing is so fun. So I think this is a super great essay to help people create a more nuanced and lifelike representation of reality in their fiction. So for me, the rest of the essays were a little bit less helpful, um, particularly in the way that Boswell has recommended reading at the beginning of each essay, which basically tell you, like, read this play, this novel, etc. to best understand the things that I'm going to be illustrating. And I didn't always feel that when he excerpts those recommendations in the actual body of his descriptions that I could understand what he was talking about. So the references are a little bit unclear. Like I feel like you kind of do have to read the things that he's talking about in order to understand um, his examples. In all honesty, I didn't actually finish the book because I got a little bit exhausted in the way that he uses um, people of color and women, so minorities, um, to illustrate uh, different techniques in writing. And what I mean by that is that he sort of uses stories that involve racism or bad things happening to women or men objectifying women in order to illustrate a writing technique. And I think the bigger issue is that um, in all of the essays you really feel 
or at least I did as a woman, that he's not exactly writing for people who don't look like him. Um, he's always writing from his vantage point as like a straight old white man. And yeah, that made me feel a little bit alienated or uncomfortable and that maybe the book wasn't really meant for someone like me to read. So for example, Boswell describes this writing conference that he went to in which a woman gives a talk about the ways in which women are represented in media as being um, inferior with a man often in a position above her, sort of like towering over her, and she argues that that is like pornographic in nature. Um, and Boswell then describes how him as well as other men in the room sort of um, attack the argument that she's making and seem bent on interrogating what she's saying. And this incident obviously seemed sort of sexist to me in nature and felt a little bit uncomfortable because he doesn't specifically address the fact that he was behaving in a sexist way or that the other people in the room were. And I think that is a common thread throughout these essays. He doesn't seem to have any awareness about the larger, like, racial um, and gender components in the stories that he's talking about. And these are real life stories that he's describing, things that actually happened to him. So I would expect for him to want to address some of the um, negative situations. Overall, I think that the first essay is really great and invaluable to people who want to become writers or just better readers, but I wish that um, you could find it online. I don't think you can find a PDF of it. I'm not sure. But either way, I would definitely photocopy that first essay for anyone who wants it. But I probably would not recommend the rest of the essays. I might turn back to some of the underlined portions and things that I found really helpful, but um, I'm just not particularly impressed with his lack of awareness when it came to discussing marginalized groups and for that reason I'm probably not going to finish the last couple of essays. Alright, so that pretty much wraps up my March books. I hope that you enjoyed my thoughts and reviews and if you would like to hear me go a little bit more in-depth on some of these books then do head over to my website. It's nellyfrancis.com um, and I do have a blog section of the website where you can go read all of my thoughts about different books that I'm reading. I hope you'll stay tuned for my April books. I do have a really fun list planned, so I hope I'll see you then. Also, I hope you'll appreciate the cute eyeliner that I did for this video, because I think it looks great.